So welcome to this tutorial which is going to have a look at how to create a bubbling test tube effect. And we're going to split this into several parts. First of all, there's a particle system which is creating the bubbles. And then this is being used to source the smoke. And finally, we're using some masks and some wind to create the random movement of the smoke once it leaves the test tube. So first of all, let's have a look at how the particle system is constructed. So let's give ourselves a little bit more space here. And our particle system is based on some of the test tube geometry. So let's have a look in here. The bubbles node contains the particle system. And we start off with an object merge. Let me change this to hide other objects. And we can see that we get a low resolution version of the test tube. I then blast away all but the very bottom of the test tube here. This is going to be the geometry that we're going to emit particles from. So we then go into our pop net. And it's a pretty simple pop net. We start off with a source pop and this is sourcing randomly from that surface that we fed into the first input. And we're birthing 25 particles per second and we're giving them a initial velocity of 1 with a little bit of variance. The next thing we do is create an attribute called max size on each particle. And this attribute is randomly set. Uh, let's just edit this. So the rand dollar ID expression here is producing a random number between 0 and 1 for each particle. And then the fit 0, 1 function converts that into a number between the two sec second and third parameters of this function. So a number between 0 0.7 and 1.2. So that gives the final maximum size of the bubble. And then what we do is set the property of the particle. Uh, we set the uniform scale property and we use another function here which uh, I'm just going to edit this expression so that we can see it properly. Uh, what we've got is dollar age which is the number of seconds that the particle has been alive and we've got a smooth function that varies between 0 and 0 0.5. So as age goes from 0 to 0 0.5 or half a second, this smooth function will smoothly go from a value of 0 to a value of 1 when age reaches 0 0.5. And then we multiply this by that attribute we just created, max size. So what this is going to do is create a slowly increasing size, uh, which starts with a size of 0, and at half a second it reaches its maximum size. And we're setting the uniform scale property, the p-scale property. And this will control uh, the scale of things that we then instance onto the particles later on. And finally we've got a limit. And the limit is a box. And we're setting the box to be just above the top of the test tube. And we can see that if we go into a side view, uh, we can see we've got smoke coming out of the. Let me re re rewind this to the first frame. And we can see we've just got a little tiny gap between the top of the test tube and this limit. And the limit box you have to set by hand. And I've positioned it so it's just above the top of the test tube. And what happens is that when any particle hits this, it's uh, killed. So that just dispenses with any particles that leave that box. So what do we do when we've got these uh, particles out of the pop net? Well we're going to use the particles for two different purposes. We're going to use them to display the bubbles inside the main part of the test tube and we're also going to use them as a source for our smoke. Uh, so we need to divide the particles into two depending on where they are in the test tube. The ones at the top we're going to use as the source the ones underneath we're going to use uh, to uh, render our bubbles. So we create a group 
and we create a bounding box and you can see the bounding box here so any particle that's inside this bounding box will be part of this group which we call emission group and everything else all the other particles will not be in this group so we then use a pair of blast nodes this blast node here is going to delete everything in emission group so that's going to just leave all the particles that are underneath the smoky part of the test tube and then there's another blast uh, which is going to delete the non-selected in other words it just leaves emission group so it leaves these particles that are in the top part of the test tube and then we're instancing uh, two different sizes of sphere to the particles for those which are here uh, which are not in the emission group uh, we instance quite a small sphere and we can see here if we put the display flag here we can see uh, very small spheres at the bottom moving up and becoming larger at the top and these are the things that are actually going to render as our bubbles and then on this side for the particles that are at the top we instance a larger sphere and the reason we do that is this gives a better effect in terms of the of the sourcing of the smoke and then we put a null here which we're going to use in our source node later on but the display flag should rest on this copy node because that's producing the bubbles that are going to be rendered well before we have a look at the dot network let's have a look at how we're rendering the test tube and I've switched off the display of the smoke so let's just take a render and we can see that I've need to just get rid of the we can see that we have a test tube which has liquid in the bottom part and glass at the top so how do we achieve that uh, well we take the test tube geometry into this node test tube outside and we start let's just go across to the scene view we start by just importing the low res geometry of the test tube we then subdivide it and then we use a pair of blast nodes and the two blast nodes this first one here blasts away the inside everything apart from the bottom of the inside of the test tube this is where our liquid is going to be and the other blast node which is just a copy of this one uh, with delete non selected disabled deletes the inside and leaves everything else and if I switch to wireframe view you can just about see that that inside piece is missing so by default the display flag is set on this outside null there's a third uh, bit of deletion that I do and that is to just leave the very top part of our test tube and we're going to use that later on to build some objects that are necessary for the top network so this stays on the outside we've then got a node called test tube liquid and all this does is object merge in that inside part of the test tube uh, because we're taking it here from that null inside that was defined in the other node and then we're sticking a cap on it and this is actually going to be our liquid and the reason we need to divide the test tube into two like this is because we want to shade correctly the passage of light as it comes down hits the outside of the test tube passes through the glass and then passes into the liquid and the reason we need to divide this into two is because we to need two slightly different shaders one shader is going to have to model light that's coming in and hitting moving from air to glass and the index of refraction of air is about one the index of refraction of glass is about 1.5 and then as it crosses the next boundary it's going from glass into the liquid and the glass has an index of refraction of about 1.5 and the liquid an index of refraction of about 1.3 and we need to model those two boundaries differently so that we can apply different shaders and let's have a look at our shaders so uh, the first shader we have is test tube glass and that's being applied to the outside part of the test tube and as you can see that has an inside index of refraction of 1.5 and an outside index of refraction of 1 uh, and the 
difference between inside and outside is defined entirely by the normals. So if we go back to our objects and have a look at our outside part of the test tube, we can see that the normals are correctly pointing out towards uh, the air. And then for the liquid, this is shaded using the shader tube liquid. And here the inside index of refraction is 1.5 and the outside index of refraction is 1.3. And you may think that's a bit odd. Surely the inside is what contains the liquid. Well, it just happens that my normals are all facing inwards because I haven't reversed them uh, to take account of the fact that this was cut out of the original tube. So where the normals are pointing is in towards the liquid. So from the point of view of the shader, that's the outside, and everything else is inside. So uh, the shader is in fact set up correctly. I might point out that in the render at the beginning of this video, uh, I had in fact set those two uh, index of refraction, indices of refraction, the wrong way around. So it was rendering incorrectly. Well, let's just have a little look at what the effect of this is. And we can see, if we have a look here, that although we know uh, that the tube has some thickness to its walls, the liquid is appearing to fill the entire tube. And in fact, that's correct. If we have a look at this photograph, for example, of a glass of wine, we can see that although we know the glass has some thickness here, what happens is that the edge of the liquid appears to come right up to the edge of the glass and that's an optical effect to do, do with how refraction works and to model it correctly you need to do something like what we've done here. So finally a word on the bubbles shader uh, which is what's applied to the spheres which are instanced onto our particles and here we have an inside index of refraction of 1 and an outside index of refraction of 1.33. Uh, the inside of the bubble is of course filled with air, whereas the outside is facing the liquid. So that's why that's set up as it is. I should also have mentioned that the colour of the liquid is derived from the fact that the tube liquid shader sets a refraction colour here. And that means that everything that's inside the liquid gets this greeny hue, which is why we have uh, the, the color there. Well, let's have a look now at the AutoDop network. But before we do that, I'm going to just demonstrate a couple of the proxy objects we've created and that we're going to use inside the AutoDop network. So the first is this smoke holder. And the smoke holder is going to act as a collision object holding the smoke in place at the top of the test tube. And we use this rather than the test tube for two reasons, one of which is that we want to have slightly thicker walls than the test tube uh, so that uh, the smoke finds it less easy to penetrate the walls. And secondly, of course, we need to have a bottom on it so that it keeps the smoke at the top of the test tube. And we derive this from that uh, section of uh, inside of the test tube that we created earlier. We then extrude it, uh, we cap the bottom and top like this to create it. And then I've just used the rigid body uh, static object shelf tool to bring that into DOPS, which is why we have the DOP import at the bottom here. The second thing I've got is this mask and the mask is going to be used to determine where certain forces and effects apply to the smoke and where they don't. And essentially what I need is a mask which covers everything which isn't directly inside the test tube. And that's because we want, for example, our wind force to apply to the smoke that's leaked out of the test tube, but not apply to the smoke that's resting in the test tube. So we start with the holder object that we just created and I import that. Uh, we then blast off the top and the bottom of that. Uh, we then polycap uh, the top of it and we polycap the bottom. Uh, 
and we then reverse it so that the normals are now pointing outwards. And then I use a box here, and the reason I'm using a box is to ensure that the volume I'm going to create with this ISO offset is big enough to envelop the whole of the simulation area. And then I'm using an ISO offset. Now, this is a perfectly normal ISO offset to create this fog volume, except I made one change, uh, which is that I've inverted the sign. And that means instead of the normal uh, process, which creates a fog object of everything inside this incoming object here, instead, uh, what I'm doing by inverting the sign is I'll have fog everywhere except for inside the object. And that's what I want for my mask. I want uh, the mask to affect everything that's not inside uh, that container area. So that's the mask. Uh, and then the final thing uh, that I construct in order to uh, use it inside the auto.network is a bit of smoke uh, or a representation of the smoke in its initial form. So again I start with a smoke holder, I delete the outside of that, I then cap the inside part and we then create a fog volume of that. And that's going to be brought in as our initial smoke that's going to exist at the beginning of our, of our simulation. Well let's have a look now at the Autodop network itself. And it's a pretty standard up-resed Autodop network. So we've got our smoke simulation nodes over here for the low-res simulation. Over this side we've got the nodes which up that simulation. We've got some static geometry here which the smoke is going to collide with. Uh, there's the smoke holder that we created earlier, but also the stand in which the test tube is resting because the smoke might collide with that as it comes out of the test tube. And then finally down here we're adding some randomized wind force in order to create a little bit of extra motion in the smoke. But let's start by having a look at the sourcing and this is this apply source node here. Uh, and we can see the sourcing better if we turn off the visualization of density. Uh, but before we do that you might ask, well, why is there some density in this test tube before the simulation has started? Uh, normally you would expect the smoke to appear because it's been sourced from an object. And of course that doesn't start happening until the, the simulation starts playing. Well, the answer is on the initial data tab of uh, your smoke node, you can actually set up some initial uh, smoke. And if you remember, we set up that volume uh, initial smoke and we're bringing that in here to give us some initial smoke at the beginning of the simulation. But I'm going to turn off the visualization of density because I want to just have a look in slightly more detail at the sourcing. So if I display the geometry here, we can see that there are some bubbles there at the top of the test tube and we can look at uh, what they look like as an SDF. We have to move to the second frame of the simulation and there we can see that that is going to be the source of our smoke. And I'm not adding any noise to this and I'm giving it a temperature of minus one. Uh, that's because when it comes out of the tube I want it to fall downwards. And if we give it a negative temperature then the normal buoyancy forces here uh, which uh, have a value of 20 they will ensure that the smoke falls downwards. Well you may ask well what happens uh, when we're sourcing smoke inside an area which already has smoke because of course we've got that initial smoke present uh, in our test tube. Well the answer is that where the source overlaps existing smoke uh, by default the emission is controlled uh, by this function here and it adds the source based on a net new source which means that it won't add any density where density exists already. It will only add density in the areas where the smoke is in a new virgin area at the top here for example. So that's our sourcing. Uh, 
Uh, I might uh, just remark, you may be wondering why it is that the bubbles already exist at the beginning of our simulation. Uh, and that's because on the Autodot network here, but rather on the PopNet here, I've set a pre-roll time of 80 frames. So that we get 80 frames worth of bubbles right at the beginning of the simulation. They exist already and we can start going straight away. So let's turn off the visualization of the source and simulate the first few frames. So what's happening is that the smoke is being emitted from those bubbles. It's falling down onto the top of the existing smoke and that's causing the smoke to overflow the bounds of the test tube. And what we want is once it uh, gets out of the bounds of the test tube, uh, we want it to start moving a little bit more randomly. And we achieve this using uh, a random wind force. So here's our wind force. Uh, it has a velocity of 1 in each direction at a scale of 10. And the reason it's got a velocity of 1 in each direction is that we're applying here into the second connector a noise. And the noise is varying between minus 1 and 1. And this multiplies the value here in the wind. So this is going to vary. It's going to basically go in all sorts of random directions as a result of that noise multiplier. Uh, but we don't want this wind to affect everything. We just want it to affect the smoke that's left the top of the tube. And we can do that by using a mask. And we saw that we built that mask volume earlier. And we bring this in using a SOP scalar field. And this is referring to that mask. Uh, we then put that into the input of a mask field so that converts that SOP scalar field into a mask suitable for using with a force. And we name it mask field. And then we merge that together with the noise and both of those are connected into the second input. So that's creating a wind force which only applies outside the test tube and which is randomized. The second thing uh, that we do is to dissipate the smoke so that as it falls down it starts to evaporate. And we need to do this using a gas dissipate node. And here is one. And if you've seen the video I did on dry ice uh, you'll see the use of this node. I'm not going to go over it in quite so much detail. But I'm using a slightly different technique here. Uh, instead of causing the gas to dissipate as it gets cooler by having a control field based on temperature. I use a control field based on a mask because what we want is that the gas outside the test tube to dissipate, the stuff inside the test tube is going to stay undissipated. Uh, so we need to have some mask data. So you'll notice my smoke node has some data applied to it. So I take an apply data node and then I'm taking a SOP scalar field and I'm bringing in that mask that we created earlier and I'm attaching that mask as a bit of data to our smoke field. And because it's attached here to the smoke field I can then refer to it here in the gas dissipate node. So we can actually visualize uh, this if we lay down a scalar field visualization node and then plug this in. Uh, we can have a look at it. Uh, we can rewind. Uh, if we show guide geometry and use smoke we can see that that is the mask uh, that we had earlier uh, with this gap in the middle. You can't obviously see the gap in the middle uh, but believe me there's a gap in the middle there which represents the top of the test tube. So we bring in this mask and we attach it as some data to the smoke. And that means that we can refer to it here in this gas dissipate node. So we're using the mask as a control field. Uh, and we're evaporating pretty quickly by subtraction. So 
point 0.3 is being subtracted from the density at every second and if we have a look at the map control to subtraction rate scale ramp here what's happening is where the mask field uh, which is is our control field where the mask field is zero in other words inside the test tube there's no uh, dissipation occurring at all but as soon as the mask becomes one uh, then full dissipation is happening and that that smoke will be evaporating pretty fast and if you remember from the dry ice video you need to apply the gas dissipate both to the low res simulation so that you can visualize it but also to the up res simulation uh, because the density field from the low res simulation isn't being reused so the up res solver also needs to calculate the dissipation of the up resed smoke uh, that also means that we need to apply this very same scalar field this mask as some data to our up res smoke node so we do exactly the same to the up res smoke as we did to the smoke and the reason for that is that when we have this switch set to up res uh, none of these nodes are actually being evaluated so this mask field won't be available to this gas dissipate node uh, because none of these nodes up here are being evaluated uh, so we need to add it in here on the up res side as well well finally let's have a little look at how this is all rendered and it's all illuminated uh, with a single spotlight uh, which is down here and I'm using some depth matte shadows on that spotlight and a little bit of shadow blur and that's necessary to make sure that the shadows on the smoke look good and then I've also got an environment light in my scene and the environment light isn't being used to illuminate the scene uh, but I've set it to let's have a look I've set it to ray tracing background and I've used a little uh, environment map here uh, and I've, I've given the credits for that in the downloadable file you'll see uh, where that comes from uh, but that just provides something interesting to reflect onto the glass uh, because if we didn't have that then the glass would look pretty dull we need something to reflect so this helps brighten up and make those reflections more interesting in terms of uh, rendering well, let's have just look at the shaders first I'm using a billowy smoke shader to shade the smoke and that's just a perfectly standard shader I'm not applying any noise to it and I'm not applying any emission I've got a wood surface shader this is a slightly modified version of the standard material shader builder and what I've done is added in a set of nodes here which create some ripples and mix in some brown color to create the sort of rippling that you saw there the, the wood grain that you saw uh, and then the floor shader is just a standard shader with a couple of texture maps applied there's some texture maps also on the on the wood shader here both a color map and I'm also using a displacement map note that I've got uh, true displacements turned off uh, that's because it's faster to render in ray tracing if we don't uh, use displacements and in this case it doesn't look that much different and finally our output nodes I'm just using a standard mantra shader shading the first hundred frames and I'm using motion blur to enable it to look a little bit better I've got a bit of animation on the camera if we have a look through the camera turn off simulation we can see uh, we can see the keyframes here there are just two keyframes and that just zooms in to the top of the test tube over the first 40 frames like so well that pretty much rounds off a description of how to create the smoke or dry ice coming out of a test tube effect I hope you found it interesting